Um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Tevita Alexanita Savelio. Aleki is taken from the middle name. I was born and raised in the island of Tonga. For most of you here in the south have no idea where Tonga is. Tonga is located northeast of Auckland, New Zealand, 1,238 miles. I've been living here in the United States for 31 years. And it's always a blessing for me to be able to stand in front of the church family and share the Word of God. Me and my family just became a member of this church family about a year ago. Uh, but before that, I have to check the time. You know, I'm always nervous about the time because a few years ago, at the church where we used to be, just south of Jackson, Tennessee, I was preaching a sermon, and I went a little bit long. It was almost an hour. And the shortest lady, the oldest person in the church family, stood at the door at the end of the sermon, shook my hand, and she said to me, Elder, I appreciate the message, but it was too long. Next time you preach, make it short. So that always a concern for me, that I do not want for the saints to, you know, to say, this is the last time we want to hear this person preaching. <laughs> so, Pastor Chris, you better be careful. Don't give him, don't give him any, any opportunity anymore because he talks a lot. Um, I said that I am from Tong Island, so I have a request for you. Because uh, English is a second language for me. And I'm asking for you that you can pray for me during the time that I deliver this message. Because, you know, sometimes my pronunciation is a little bit, you know, it doesn't really clear. That the Holy Spirit will help you to understand the message that I have this morning. But before that, let's pray. Father in heaven, I'm just a handful of dust in your hand. I pray and I ask that you mold me into your image. Speak through me. Open the hearts of your church family that we live from here. We will change people. We're ready to live a life according to your will. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The title of my message it says, the power of forgiveness. The power of forgiveness. Matthew 18, verse 21 and 22. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until... Seventy times seven. Peter had come to Christ with a question, how often some my brother sins against me, and I forgive him till seven times. The rabbis limited the exercise of forgiveness to three offenses. Peter, carrying out as he supposed the teaching of Christ, thought to extend it to seven. The number signifying perfection, but Christ taught that we are never to become weary of forgiving. Not seven times, he said, but until 70 times seven. That's from Christ's object lesson, page 243. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 14, there is a very important phrase here that Jesus after he taught the disciple about Lord's Prayer. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. 
But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will a father forgive your trespasses. What will happen when I don't forgive you for what you did to me? The Bible is very clear that if we don't forgive men what they did wrong to us, our Heavenly Father will not forgive us. I don't know about you, but I want my Heavenly Father to be able to forgive me. That is the power of forgiveness. You are able to forgive those that have done wrong towards you or me. So therefore, your Heavenly Father will be able to forgive you. In Matthew 18, the, where the, our scripts are reading, verse 23 to 35 records the parable of the two tethers. One owed the king 10,000 talents, and one owed his fellow servant 100 denarii. The NIV footnotes usually say that this is equivalent to a several million dollars versus a few dollars. A more accurate comparison is based on how much time it would take to earn these respective amounts of money. Let us begin with 100 denarii. The denarii was one day's wage for a typical day laborer who worked six days a week with a Sabbath day of rest, allowing approximately two weeks for various Jewish holidays, the typical laborer worked 50 weeks, 50 weeks of the year and earned an annual wage of 300 denarii. 50 weeks times six days equal 300. Therefore, 100 denarii was one third of a year's salary or four months' wages. Now, suppose you continue to work as a day laborer, earning 300 denarii each year. After 20 years of such labor, you will have earned 6,000 denarii. At this point, the king would say to his debtor, congratulations, you have worked for 20 years and have now earned 6,000 denarii. That's enough to pay back one talent. You only have 9,999 more talents to go. From this, we can easily see that if it takes 20 years to earn one talent, then repaying 10,000 talents would require working 200,000 years. How absurd then for the servant to beg for mercy, and tell the king that he would pay back everything. As a day laborer, he had no hope, almost literally not in a million years, of ever repaying his debt. What would a, what would a hundred denarii and 10,000 talents look like in today's dollars? In 2010, California's minimum wage was $8 an hour. From Matthew chapter 20, verse 1 to 16, we know that the laborer worked 12 hours per day, which is 72 hours per week. Under California law, they would be paid 40, 40 hours a week at a $8 an hour and 32 hours of overtime at $12 an hour for a weekly wage of $704. Thus, their annual wage, assuming they work 50 weeks as above, would be $704 per week times 50 weeks equal $35,200. Therefore, if 100 denarii equal four months' salary at that minimum wage, it would be equivalent to $11,733.33. 33. 
which is substantially more than the NIV footnote of a few dollars. Earning $35,200 per year at minimum wage, how much would you earn in 200,000 years to equal 10,000 talents? $35,200 times 200,000 year, 200, years equals $7.4 billion. For perspective, $7.4 billion is approximately one-eighth of the total wealth of Bill Gates. The richest man in the U.S. and the second richest in the world has a net worth of $53 billion as of 2010. If you had $7.4 billion available to repay a debt, you would be number 102 in the 2010 Forbes magazine list of billionaires. This story illustrates the mercy of the king. There was no way not in a million years that this person would be able to pay back his debt. That's why there is power in forgiveness. When God said that, when Jesus said that if you forgive those that have wronged you, your heavenly father will be able to forgive you. But if not, your heavenly father will not forgive you. It's interesting that this servant that went out and, 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 and found a fellow servant that owed him the denarii, and what he did to him, throw him in prison. You know, we're going to just make the story short. What he owed, he was forgiven before, but because of what he did to his fellow servant, the king gave back to him what he owed. So therefore, there is power in forgiveness. I know it's very hard for us to forgive those that has wronged us. We're going to look at Joseph and his brothers. In Genesis chapter 50, verse 16, 17, and 18, six, verse 16, 17, and 18 of Genesis chapter 50. And the Bible said, And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he die, saying, Shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants. After the burial of Jacob, fear against filled the hearts of Joseph's brother. Notwithstanding his kindness towards them, conscience killed, made them distrustful and suspicious. It might be that he had but delayed his revenge out of regard to their father, and that he would now visit upon them the long deferred punishment for their crime. They dare not appear before him in person, but send a message. Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall he say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sins, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. This message affected Joseph to tears, and encouraged by this, his brothers came and fell down before him with the words, Behold, we be thy servants. Joseph's love for his brothers was deep and unselfish, and he was pained at the thought that they could regard him as cherishing a spirit of revenge towards them. Fear not, he said, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Now therefore, ye, now therefore fear ye not, 
I will nourish you and your little one. This is a very interesting, powerful story. You know, the thing about it, nine of the brothers, they deserve death penalty. Reuben was the only one that had a common sense. When they, they decided to kill Joseph, he was the only one that, that said, do not shed any blood because he's our brother. And he had a different plan. He was thinking he wanted to throw Joseph into the pit and later took him out and deliver him to his father. So he was the only one that had common sense, even though that he also liked, you know, they, they did not like Joseph. I want you to think about this situation. Jacob had no idea that all the brothers don't even like Joseph. He had no idea that the, the brothers are thinking of taking Joseph's life. You know, the interesting thing is Joseph, Jacob had no idea that this problem, it was most of it caused by him. Let's look at it as, as parenting. You know, sometimes, I don't know if it's happened to you, but when you have, uh, you know, 12 sons and you so favor to one of them, you love this, you know, these sons more than the rest, you know, the rest is just okay. You are the special one. You are the promised one. So therefore, when that favorite one birthday come around, you go to Macy or Chasey Penny and buy, you know, their birthday presents for them, for that special one. But when the rest of the other children's birthday come around, you just go to a thrift store, maybe Walmart. That created this, this hatred inside these brothers because they look at it and say, wait a minute. Why is it that you treated this person with more love or uh, a, special, uh, a special treat for this person, but not us? Jacob didn't even understand that. But the brothers... They hated that. All they were thinking about is a way to get rid of him. Not only the dreams that had, uh, Joseph had dreamed and make things even worse because they were thinking that this guy, he's going to be a ruler over us. So the only way to solve this problem is to get rid of him. Interesting how... Um, Spirit of Prophecy said, you know, about Joseph, that he's a type of Christ. I'm going to read it here from uh, Patriarch on Patriarch the Prophet, page 239, 240. The life of Joseph illustrates the life of Christ. It was envy that moved the brothers of Joseph to sell him as a slave, they hoped to prevent him from becoming greater than themselves. And w when he was carried to Egypt, they flattered themselves that they were to be no more trouble with his dream, that they had removed all possibility of their fulfillment. But their own cause was overruled by God to bring about the very event that they designed to hinder. So the Jewish priests and elders were jealous of Christ fearing that he would attract the attention of the people from them. They put him to death to prevent him from becoming king, but they were thus bringing about this very result. Joseph, through his bondage in Egypt, became a savior to his father's family. Yet this fact did not lessen the guilt of his brothers. So the crucifixions of Christ by his enemies made him the redeemer of mankind the savior of the fallen race, and ruler over the whole world. But the crime of his murderers was just as heinous as though God's providential hand had not controlled events for his own glory, 
and the good of man. As Joseph was sold to the heathen by his own brothers, so Christ was sold to his bitterest enemy by one of his disciples. Joseph was falsely accused and thrust into prison because of his virtue. So Christ was despised and rejected because his righteous, self-denying life was a rebuke to sin. And though guilty of no wrong, he was condemned upon the testimony of false witnesses. And Joseph's patience and meekness under injustice and oppressions, his ready forgiveness and no noble benevolence toward his unnatural brothers represents the Savior's uncomplaining endurance of the malice and abuse of wicked men. And his forgiveness not only of his murderers, but of all who have come to him confessing their sins and seeking pardon. Can you and me be Christ-like? If we give our life to God, we can be Christ-like. We can be those that bring those from darkness to the light. We can save those that are lost to the heavenly kingdom. Because that was the work that Christ came to this earth to do. To call the lost and save those that lost to eternal death. So you and me can be Christ-like if we surrender and give our life to him. He can use us in a way that you and I cannot comprehend. Let's look at King Saul and David. Why did Saul want to kill David? Why do you think that King Saul wanted to kill David? Jealousy is the same thing with Joseph and his brother. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 6 through 8. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 6, 7, and 8. And it came to pass as they came when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tablets, with joy, and with instruments of music. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul hath slain his thousand, and David his ten thousand. And Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousand, and to me they have ascribed but a thousand. And what can he have more but the kingdom? Yeah, the king is uh, concerned because he's thinking that the, the heart of the people has slowly moved to follow king, uh, David before he even become a king. But because of jealousy, he wanted to take David's life. So David become a fugitive. He ran for his life. It is amazing that when, as from a human perspective, if someone wanted to take your life, sometimes we think that the best thing to do is to take that person's life before he or she take my life first. That is the, the human perspective, or, you know, uh, but David, something very interesting about David. The opportunity arises for him to take the life of his enemy, King Saul. So we all know the story it happened twice. And when his men encouraged him to take Saul's life, what did David say? David said in 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 6, And David, he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do these things unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is anointed of the Lord. Wow.
There's something about David. There is someone who is ruled in his heart. And that is definitely God is in control in the heart of David. Because twice the opportunity came to him to take the life of his enemy. But he said, how can I do such thing to take the life of King Saul, the anointed of God? Joseph, on the other hand, when he was facing the temptation, his reactions were, how can I do such things and sin against my God? When we surrender our life and allow God to live in our heart, he is the one that ruled in our heart, in our thought, in our mind. Therefore, we are going to live our life according to his will. Not about our feelings, not about what my friend said, but what thus says the Lord. That is what is amazing about these two young men, Joseph and David. Because they allow the Lord to take control in their life. Spirit of Prophecy said this in Sign of the Time, October 12, 1888. The cause of David made it manifest that he had a ruler whom he obeyed. He could not permit his natural passion to gain the victory over him. For he knew that he that ruleth his own spirit is greater than he who taketh a city. If he had been led and Controlled by human feelings, he would have reasoned that the Lord had brought his enemy under his power in order that he might slay him and take the government of Israel upon himself. Saul's mind was in such a condition that his authority was not respected, and the people were becoming irreligious and demoralized. Yet the fact that Saul had been divinely chosen king of Israel kept him in safety. For David conscientiously served God and he would not in any wise harm the anointed of the Lord. That's powerful. Because if someone is seeking to take your life and then you turn around and say, that is not God's will for me to do that. Because that person, no matter what he has done, but he's still an anointed of God. Sometimes it's so different for us to distinguish the feelings and from what is God said. I know my time's up. I'm in trouble now. Because I'm just halfway. <laughs> uh, just give me 10 minutes. I always do that. And asking for, for, for some times and, and, and some of the audience, some of the, the church look at me kind of funny. Some uh, said, you know, in their looks, just hurry up and, 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 you know, go to the closing. David, when he committed adultery, adultery and a murderer. It is powerful what he wrote in Psalm 51, verse 4, verse 1 through 4 and 10 and 11. I'm going to read it in your hearing so we can move forward. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercy, Blot out my transgression, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Create in me, verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. 
people question God, and they say, why, you know, they, people, why was God so harsh with King Saul, which his uh, sin was uh, less, you know, from, from a, a, a human perspective, compared to David, a murderer, and also a gomita adultery. Listen to a spirit of prophecy. Many have murmured at what they call David injustice in sparing, I'm, I'm sorry, many have murmured at what they call God injustice, injustice in sparing David, whose guilt was so great after having rejected Saul for what appeared to them to be a far less fragrant sin. But David humbled himself and confessed his sin while Saul despised reproof and hardened his heart in impenitence. That is the difference. David was sincere. David acknowledged his mistake. And he asked God for forgiveness. But King Saul, he hardened his heart. So when we come before God and ask for forgiveness... We have to be sincere. We have to be honest with ourselves. And do not be afraid of the punishment, but willing to take the punishment and also ready to be cleansed by God. The last few words of Jesus at the cross, he said this in, in Luke, chapter, uh, Luke chapter 23, verse 34. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The Savior made no murmur of complaint. His face remained calm and serene, but great drops of sweat stu stood upon his brow. There was no beating hand to wipe the death dew from his face, nor words of sympathy and unchanging fertility to stay his human heart. While the soldiers were doing their fearful work, Jesus prayed for his enemy. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's only Jesus' prayer for you and me. Father, forgive them. How are we going to be able to live out a life according to God's will? The Bible said in Matthew 5, verse 44, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. The only way that we can love our enemies and bless them that curse us, do good to them that hate us, and pray for them that persecute us, we need to die to self then we submit ourselves to Christ. The heart is united with his heart. The will is merged in his will. The mind becomes one with his mind. The thoughts are brought into captivity with him. We live his life, and only then we can forgive our enemies and love them. I'm going to close with a story. 14th of uh, last month, I flew to Auckland, New Zealand. Most of you know I went to Auckland, New Zealand because of my mother's passing. But I'm going to share a story about the truth between me and my mother. 1974, I was eight years old. My parents divorced. In the island of Tonga, especially one of the outer islands, divorce was very rare. It don't really happen, you know, in a population of 1,200 in a small island like that. You don't, you don't see divorce happen there. But my situation was different. Our mother left us left our father for another man. It was one of the most uh, devastating 
be honest with you, I was ashamed of my mother. I remember standing with my father and my mother in front of the judge. I am the oldest of four. And the judge asked me, because he's going to divide four children between our parents. And the judge asked me, who do you want to live with? Without a doubt, I told the judge, I want to go with my father. Because at eight years old, you already have a little bit of understanding. You know a little bit what's going on. I did not want to live with my mother. So our father took me and the baby and the family and we went back to the island where I was born and raised. Our mother stayed in the mainland. And because I grew up with my father, there was, praise the Lord, there was someone there that fulfilled the role of a mother. My father's oldest brother, his wife. What a precious soul, this person to me. She raised me and my younger brother and the rest of her children. She loved me and my younger brother and her children the same. But because of the anger and hatred, I'm sorry to use that word, a hatred in my heart towards my mother, I wanted to respect my father, I wanted to make my father happy because my father said that our mother, to him, she's passed on, she's, she's dead and buried. So there is no talking about her. So I grew up with that anger and that hatred in my heart towards my mother. My father said, it's okay for me if you want to go visit your grandmother which is my mom's mother, I have no problem with her. And I remember I was old, I was 19 at that time, I went to visit my grandmother and, and my mom's sister. And my grandmother told me, you know, I love your father, he was a great man. It's just my daughter, she's a, just a different person. I do not understand how I raised someone and turn around to be so different from the rest of the children. But she is the oldest daughter, my mother. But I decided in my life I, will, I have nothing to do with my mother. I will never go and see her. I don't want to talk to her. It took me 34 years to be able to forgive my mother. 1996, uh, the first time I went back to Tonga, let me get back to, you know, my, uh, my sister was, was taken, you know, our, our mother took my sister, we have one sister, and the, the other brother, and because my mother wanted to be free, she gave away our sister, and my brother, raised by my mother, my, my grandmother, which is her mother, but my sister was taken by a different family, adopted her, and they moved to New Zealand. And they decided, because at that time, my, uh, my sister was um, about six or seven, they don't want our, our sister to have contact with us, because they were afraid that the, our sister would be able to come back to us. So they moved to New Zealand and later moved to Australia. 1996, I decided to go back to Tonga and my sister was, was able to, um, to search for, for our father. And my father gave her my number and she called me. I was about to travel and my sister, can you come 21 years? I haven't seen my sister. Can you come and visit? And I said, sure. So I flew to Sydney, Australia, spent 11 days with her. We 
we laughed, we, we, we talked, and when I was about to continue with my travel to Tonga, my sister asked me this question. Are you going to go see our mother? And I said, I am sorry, but I have no plan to go see her. And my sister said, why? And I said, I don't know why you're asking me why. You know what, you know, the reason why. And my sister said, I thought that you were a Christian. <laughs> and that really like stabbed in my heart. And I, here I thought that I'm a good Seventh-day Adventist. And my sister throw this question at me. And I said, what do you mean? She said, I wasn't we supposed to forgive, forget, and move on? And I said, it's easy for you to say that. And my sister said to me, you know, she left me too. It was not just you. And I told my sister, you know, I'm going to go to Tonga, but I'm not going to promise anything. So I went on my trip, went all the way to the island where my father is. And I remember my aunt, which was the mother to us, asked me, are you going to go and visit your mom? And I said, I, I don't think so, because I do not want to upset my father. And my aunt said, you know, it will be good for you to go visit her. The, the day that I flew back to go to Tonga, to the mainland, to come back to U.S., I decided to stop over where my mother is and it's go and visit her and spend a couple of days with her. You know, it was a disappointment. Because I went there with an expectation that she will tell me the truth and I will forgive her. But that's not what happened. I asked her, I want her to tell me the truth because every story that I've heard it was the same as my father's story even her mother. But when I asked her, she told me a different story. And I, when I left her and I said to myself, why did I even waste my time coming here to visit her? Because she lied to me. You know, brothers and sisters, the problem with me, I went over there with expectation that she would tell me the truth. Therefore, she gave me the truth, then I will forgive her. God's mercy and forgiveness doesn't, there's no condition. He already forgave you, you just have to come to him. So when I left there, I said, you know what, this is it, no more. I'm not going to go talk to her, I'm not going to see her no more. I should have listened to my father. That was 1996. Until 2008. For some reason, I remember my wife always said to me, you know, when, when there's something it is so long, when you're not, a, not able to forgive someone, it hurt you more than the other person. It affected you more. My mother don't even know what is going on with me, but it affected me in my life. So 2008, I decided to fly back to Tonga to unite my family. I contact my sister in Australia, my brother living in New Zealand, and the other brother in Tonga, and I told them my plan. I wanted to unite everybody, even my father. That was the most difficult one to convince. When I arrived back in Tonga, talked with my father, explained to him my plan, and my father said, I'm not going to be part of this union thing. I pray about it, it took me six days to convince him. Finally, he decided, he, he agreed that he would be part of it, and that day came for the first time we had a family get together. Four children with our father and our mother. The first time that our mom, there was opportunity for everybody to speak. The first time our mother stood up and ask for forgiveness. You know, it's only by the power of God that I was able to forgive my mother because it took me 34 years. I'm asking 
if anybody here that you have anger or hatred toward a person for many years, believe me, there is no way you can do it on your own. It's only by the grace of God that you can be able to forgive those that have wronged you. Amen.